Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. We're going back to the rock, that rock Christ Jesus. We're going to be looking into the biblical aspects from a lot of different angles this time. Uh, I have taught on this many years ago, going to teach on it again today, and uh, we're going to be looking at some new things that I, that I have found, and I think it might be even more interesting uh, for you as we go back through this story, and I'm hoping that my Jewish friends that join into this broadcast tonight are going to be blessed by this because it might be something that helps open their own eyes uh, to recognize who the Messiah really is, who the Messiah was being pointed to. So this is going to be a great, uh, great broadcast, I do believe. I'm going to be getting into that in just a moment here. And before I get into that, though, let me also share with you this coming Thursday night, 8 p.m., Eastern Time, we've got a brand new link we've created for Zoom, and I have upped my Zoom uh, abilities to have up to 500 people on a meeting, and all you'll have to do is type in, and it has to be the www.stephenbenoon.com. That's how you'll get to be a part of this, and uh, it's totally free of charge. Uh, there's no no charge on this, you know. We just we just pay the difference monthly in order to be able to host up to 500 people, and I may have to up that to a thousand. I don't I don't know. Uh, that's it's not an easy thing to do when you're hosting that many people in a private meeting. But uh, what my uh, focus is this coming Thursday is for praying and counseling people uh, that are sick, uh, people that want to be prayed for. Uh, at the same time, taking that time to really counsel people uh, specifically uh, about how to have your heart right and ready for prayer. Now, I may also, and it may be the following week that I do this, for those that really need a, a very specific uh, focused prayer, we'll say, for example, we, I may open up a, a an invited Zoom, and that'll be be similar to this. It'd still be using the same Zoom link, but what I may have is if I've got some very serious cases, and uh, we might, I might do up to 20 people in a Zoom meeting like that there, very serious cases that really need, we need to talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with you, but I have to kind of do it in a group. It's very difficult to take everyone individually like this. So I, need to, I still need to be able to do it in like in a group setting, but where I could focus more like that. But this coming Thursday, though, we're going to allow up to 500 people because that's all I can do on the Zoom. You know, they charge you like 600 bucks a year to do this. And uh, so I'm going to make it to where <clears throat> up to 500 people can come in. And I'm really wanting to instruct people. We're going to do like a, a prayer for everybody that's on there that needs to be prayed for, for healing of the body. But I really want to, to, to really speak directly to um, how, how, for, how for you to believe and to receive that. So I don't want to get into that right now, uh, but I just want to let you know that. So I, I'm excited. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And finally, I've got that set up. So anyway, let's go back to this message here, though, that I wanted to share with you about the Rock Christ Jesus and again, I, I, I'm saying that right now, but if you're Jewish and you're listening to this broadcast, or if you're not Jewish, maybe you're, maybe you're a Muslim uh, listening to this broadcast and you, and you do not know, um, which speaking of the Muslim friends uh, out there and the Palestinian friends that might listen to this broadcast today, I found a startling prophecy that I have a feeling is speaking about your plight, uh, what you're going through right now. And uh, it's 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 a horrible tragedy, and uh, I'm still I'm still kind of looking at it. It's one of it's in an ancient document uh, that uh, is one of the many thousands that are out there. But uh, I, I happened to run across this recently, and I seen it a little while back, and then I came across it again, and, I, and it's really made me think a lot about the plight of the people of Gaza, and it. It's it's certainly it's, it prophesies to detail of what you're suffering, and so I, I do want to go into a message on that for the people of Gaza specifically. 
Uh, anyway, this though is for everybody, and I really hope this will be a blessing to so many of you out there. Um, let's. I'm trying to think where the best place would be to start on this, and um, so I'm going to probably let's first uh, before I come here. We're in Exodus right now, chapter. Oh goodness, what am I? What chapter am I even in right here on this one? This is 32, I think. No, 33. Exodus 33. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's Exodus chapter 33. That's where Moses is going to be, you know, God's going to have him stand in the, in, in the uh, you know, stand on the rock and, and he's going to pass by to see his glory, right? Uh, but before I go there, I, I think what I want to do is, um, let's see. And I do not remember why. Oh, Deuteronomy 32. Yeah, we're, we're going to go into Deuteronomy 32 as well. All right, we're going to first take, I think, the book of Numbers and the book of Exodus. These are the places where uh, God smites the rock. Or, or uh, let me put it this way. In one place, God tells Moses to speak to the rock. But Moses doesn't speak to the rock. He gets angry, goes out there and smites the rock to, the, to bring forth the water. In another place, he tells him to smite the rock. So let's look at this first here, and we're going to start here. This is in Numbers chapter 20. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there, and there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people strove with Moses, spoke, saying, what that we had perished when our brethren perished before the Lord? And why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness to die there, we and our cattle? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And by the way, if you've ever looked, and I'll just show you real quick here on the maps there. I'd like for you to kind of see this. Um, let's take and let's run all the way over there to the Middle East. Going right here into the Gulf of Aqua. Egypt, as you can see, the land of Goshen is kind of up here in the far right-hand corner uh, back in biblical times there. It is a very well-fertile land there around the, around the, uh, the Nile River. And uh, But when God had them go out, I do agree with Ron Wyatt's discovery. In fact, the book I wrote, Yam Suf, uh, for those of you that um, uh, do not know, I've actually authored two books. Uh, my first book totally has to be rewritten. Uh, <laughs> when I wrote that book there, I really was a pro-Zionist. Uh, so I made a very good argument. In fact, this trailer I right hear about Yom Suf uh, is about the book that I wrote. Um, so, it, you know, if you ever watch that particular uh, trailer there, this they were doing this trailer for the uh, for the History Channel uh, because there was a, a great interest with the History Channel about doing a documentary on the book that I wrote, Yom Suf. But anyway, um, uh, let's see, just go to images here. The only thing that I would say... Oh my goodness, even Walmart has my book. I didn't know that. That's kind of interesting, right? Walmart's carrying my book. So the I still think though the last chapter, well, a lot of the chapters are good in this book there, but the the pro-Zionist side, which there's not a lot of pro-Zionism in this book here, it's more about the uh the Exodus itself. And actually Mary Lou Wyatt, Ron's uh uh, uh late wife, there, you know, of course he passed away. And uh, Mary was married to him. She had given me permission to use the book of where he had found the chariot wheel on the bottom of the seafloor. And it's covered in gold. Cerise and coral can't grow on gold. And so I'm really uh, very honored and so appreciative of Mary Lou uh, allowing me to use that on there. So anyway, yeah, you could actually still order that book. Uh, you know, I don't think I've, I've never claimed a single royalty on this book. And uh, I've always would just order books instead. So who knows? I have no idea how many it's been sold. I've never had to pay for books though either, even when I order them for conferences and things like that. But but anyway, going back to this though, the reason why I say that, and let me just quickly pull the image up here. Like I said, it's all fertile up in here, but they had taken this 
part right across the Gulf of Aqaba, and it's actually shallow enough there, like 200 feet deep, to where if you remove the water, it would be a flat plain to walk across on. Other than that, it's a thousand foot drop gorges on either side. And over in this area, it's nothing but desert, and this is where they went to. So yeah, there is no fertile place, no way to plant, nothing like what you have up here in Egypt where you got the lush greens and stuff like that to be able to plant with there. So that's what they were faced with there. So when we're reading the story here in the, uh, where were we at here? We were in the book of Numbers right here. That's why they're saying that, you know. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of the meeting and fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and their brethren, and speak you unto the rock before their eyes, that it give forth its water. And you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. So you shall give the congregation and their cattle drink. Now, before I continue on here, let me show you as well. In the book of Exodus, um, they encamped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Now, if you'll notice in the book of Numbers and then in the book of Exodus, book of Exodus, they are not at Rephidim. They are in the wilderness of Zin in the first month when they first came out. This one here in Exodus is many, many years later. But the interesting uh, part of this is, is that it's the same rock. Now, the reason it's believed to be the same rock is because in the Hebrew word that is used there, it's Hatsur, <clears throat> the rock in Horeb, okay? And here it is right here, al Hatsur, what you see highlighted in blue on your screen on the left there. The, the letter He, which is this letter right there, is a definite article in Hebrew, and it literally means the rock. So it says in there, Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb. Bechorev. All right. And... Uh, in the book of Numbers, as they're striving against Moses about this, um, <clears throat> he says here, speak you unto the rock before their eyes that it give forth its water. And, uh, okay, let's see here. So we go over here. Got to find the rock in here. Oh, wait a minute, I, got, I forgot, I got, I'm looking at the word speak to the rock, okay. Okay. Silah is right here is where they're using there for the word rock, okay. And then, uh, yeah, so they use Silah over here versus uh, Atsur. Just a different form of the of the word there for the word rock. But in either case, though, in one place, God tells him to speak to the rock. In the other place, he tells him to smite the rock. In Exodus, God's going to tell him to the Lord of my work. Let's see. Moses, uh, let's see. Pass on. Let me make, make sure. We'll cry to the Lord saying, what shall I do to the people? And the Lord said to Moses, pass on. People take thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherein thou smotest the river, and take in thy hand, and go, and behold, I will stand there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. All right. The first time around, though, he was to speak to the rock. But what happens, though? Moses gets angry instead. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, and he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, you rebels, are we to bring you forth water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and smote the rock with his rod twice, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank in their cattle. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, because you believe not me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. 
God never said, go smite the rock. Not that first time. He said to them to go speak to the rock. And of course, that rock represents Jesus Christ. Now, another fascinating part, you know, because like I said, we're reading here, we're reading here from the, uh, the book of Numbers. If you go over here to Exodus, and this one, uh, I think it's chapter, yeah, it's chapter 33. And by the way, in Exodus, um, where they're here, I think it's Exodus 20, no, 17. This is where the second time it happens and says the people strove with Moses and gave us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why strive you with me? Wherefore do you try the Lord? And the people thirsted for water and the people murmured against Moses and said, you know, wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children, our cattle with thirst? Moses cried unto the Lord saying, what shall I do unto this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said unto Moses, pass on before the people and take Take you of the elders of Israel and thy rod, and wherewith you smote us the river, take in your hand and go. And behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so on the side of the elders of Israel. All right. And so different, and it's given a different name, different place, um, and at a different time period in Israel's wilderness journey. But even after this, now before, here's what I found interesting as I was looking at this, because every, every bit of this is a type of Christ to begin with. Uh, Christ is going to be smitten, but he's only going to be smitten once. That's another reason why God was angry with Moses is because he smites the rock twice. You know, one, he told him to speak to the rock. You know, Christ will give the water of life when you speak and ask. But in this case here, Moses angrily, because he had a temper, goes out there and beats the rock in order to bring forth the water. Now, if you back up, what I found very fascinating, and this is, uh, this is going into where God is speaking to Moses here in Exodus 33. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Depart, go up out of the, thou and thy people, thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, and to the land of which I swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed, I will give it. And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they, they mourned, and no man did put on his, his ornaments. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people. If I go up in the midst of you for one moment, I shall consume you. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from you, that I may know what to do unto you. So even though God is going to fulfill the promise that he makes to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's still really angry with the way the children of Israel have been doing this entire time during the wilderness journey. Now, as we move on down, though, God, uh, let's see, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend, and he would return into the camp, but but his minister Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tent. It's talking about where, you know, he'd go up, they'd go to the tent of meeting where they would pray and the people would stand back afar off and watch to see what would happen. Um, and Moses said unto the Lord, See you say unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou said, hast said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now thy ways, that I may know you, to the end that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said unto him, If your presence go not with me, carry us not up from here. For wherein now shall it be known that I have found grace in thy sight? I and thy people, is it not in that 
you go with us so that we are distinguished, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, show me, I pray, your glory. That's what Moses asked of God. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Can't, you cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon the rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. I'm going to tell you something. That caught my attention recently. You know, have you ever seen the... Um, let me just, let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, and that's in Saudi Arabia. Here we go. Oh, goodness. Um, I think it's, yeah, here we go right here. Penny, Penny Caldwell and her husband were the ones that actually uh, brought back the good images of this here, of this particular rock right here. And this rock is believed to be, um, let me just see if I can blow it up a little bit bigger for you guys there. This is believed to be the rock that perhaps that uh, Moses smote that split. And they've, there is actually, if you've ever seen the base of it, massive, the water, the water erosion uh, effects are really striking when you see this right here. But even if you were to say, take two, for example, as we just read there, God said he would hide him in the cleft of the rock. You know, this rock, of course, definitely has got a cleft right there uh, coming down like it is. And uh, I think in one picture that they did, they're actually standing up there at it. And because uh, the rock is just massive in size there. So, um, you would get a better idea that, yeah, you could be hidden in the cleft of that rock. But the thing is, though, it's not so much that that I'm looking at there. He said, you cannot see my face and live. And he says, stand upon the rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I believe that it's a reference to hiding him in Jesus Christ. When he talks about putting him into the cleft of the rock. Because you've got to remember, God doesn't allow Moses to go over. But he wanted to see his glory. And I believe that the way he saw his glory, he was hidden in the cleft of the rock until he passed by. And oddly enough, isn't it interesting that it's Moses and Elijah that are on the Mount Transfiguration? And so it was something I thought very interesting in light of all of this here to begin with as well. And then you have Deuteronomy 32. Give, you, give ear, you heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. This is where Moses also really goes uh, into the judgment of Israel. He said, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity and just and right is he. And corruption his? Is, is corruption his? No. His children in the blemished generation, crooked and perverse. Do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is, not, uh, is it not he, thy father, that hath begotten thee? Hath he not made thee and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your fathers, and he will declare unto you thine elders, and they will tell you. 
When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the children of men, he set the borders of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the portion of the Lord is his people, Jacob, and a lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in a waste, in a howling wilderness. He compassed him about. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Going down a little further, verse 12, the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on high places of the earth, and he did eat the fruitage of the field, and he made him to suck honey out of the crag and the oil out of the flinty rock. Jumping on down even further, verse 16, they roused him to jealousy with, a, with strange gods. With abominations, they did provoke him. They sacrificed unto demons. Think about that for a little while. No gods, gods that they knew not, new gods they came up of late, which your fathers dreaded not. Of the rock that begot you, you were unmindful. You remember as the scripture says, the, the rock that the master, or the stone that the master builders rejected became the head of the corner? That was a rock as well. That was Christ himself. You know, so, I mean, there's so much that could be said on that note right there. Uh, we may come back to this here, because this was the other issue that was going on with the children of Israel at the time. Uh, and this actually happened right before the smiting of the rock there, where they were murmuring, you know, because they they remembered the food that they had, the fish that they had, and you know, the, uh, and of course it says there were a mixed multitude that was among them, fell a lusting, and the children of Israel wept on their part and said, Would not we were given flesh to eat? We remember the fish, which were, we were wont to eat in Egypt for naught, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And, uh, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. We have not saved this manna to look to. Now, I found this interesting because, you know, as they're doing all this complaining, you know, then God gets angry and God sends in the serpents and kills them because of it. And we've talked about this before. So let's jump over, though. I want to, to save time. We, we won't go into this this time here. Let me jump over here. Um, because... Truly, as I said, Jesus Christ was that rock. And I want to show you because the story here in John's Gospel, chapter 4, speaks about that and uh, indirectly. And then we look at the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John, I believe, is the fulfillment of what Jesus is telling the woman of Samaria about. Uh, so let me let me take you to the Gospel of John, though. Now, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Going to verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask, Drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says unto you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence do you have this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him 
shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have well said, I know I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, <clears throat> and he whom you uh, now have is not your husband. And that uh, you said truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah comes when he is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I that speak unto you am he. Now, if you notice, he tells her that if she knew who it was that was talking to her, he'd give her water and she wouldn't have to come to that well any longer. But you see, what had to happen, though, in order for that water to be released he had to be smitten. Just like what Moses did to the rock, even though God said, speak to the rock, in her case, she spoke to the rock. And he gave forth that water. But when Moses was told to speak to the rock, he goes out and smites the rock instead. And that's exactly what Israel did because why? Israel is a stiff-necked and rebellious people. And even God says to Moses, when he wanted to see his glory, I'll hide you in the rock until I be passed over. And in reality, what did God do? God took Moses in an unknown grave, unknown place, hid him away in the rock, Christ Jesus, until Jesus passed over. And that's when we saw Moses on Mount Transfiguration. After the glory of the Lord had passed by. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that blows me away. So we, move, we look over here as well, right? When Jesus, when he was crucified, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. By the way, that's not a Roman soldier as some like to convince you that it is. The soldiers that actually took Jesus were the temple soldiers. Uh... I know they'd given him over to Pilate for the scourging and stuff like that. Wait, well, let me put it this way. It could be argued that it could have been the temple guards instead of the actual Roman soldiers. So whether or not it really is a Roman soldier or not, I guess that's debatable. But nonetheless, a soldier with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. In other words, they wouldn't have to break his legs for him to die. He was already dead. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Now, that's, a, that's another one for you as well. We'll look at that in just a second. And, af and after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore and took the body of, of Jesus. Notice though, John tells you, and again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's Zechariah's prophecy. Do you know how many people quote Zechariah as an unfulfilled scripture? I used to do it. And yet John says that it's already fulfilled. What do you know? 
But when that soldier pierced his side and the water and the blood came out and the water separated from his blood, that was the rock Christ Jesus being smitten right before the entire world. You know, if you look at the book of Enoch as well, another fascinating um, part here, and I don't even know if I, yeah, I've still got it up here. When he goes into this thing about the sheep and stuff, and it just seems to be very obvious that it's speaking of Christ as a prophecy, but he said, he ascended to the top of the rock, and when the rest of the sheep began to grow blind and to wander from the path which had been shown them, but he knew it not, their Lord, however, was moved with great indignation against them when the sheep had learned what had happened. Uh, that, that's a, I won't go into the reading of all that there, but it, it is kind of interesting if you ever look at this here. Now, let me find the chapter for you. There we go. It's chapter ooh, LXXXV1111. I, I don't know what chapter that would be, but, uh, but, but it's an interesting chapter there. If you Pull up the book of Enoch and and uh, just do a search word search for rock. You'll find it real easily. You know, kind of an interest, just interesting little insight there uh, to share there. And um, you know, let's see here. Oh goodness, uh, you know when I pulled this up here, his blood be on us and on our children. This is what the Jews were saying about uh, Jesus when uh, when he was being crucified. There's been a lot of articles written about this in the positive instead of the negative. And most of these people, I do believe, got this from the teaching I did about ooh, 13, 14 years ago, something like that, where I first brought this out. Uh, I think it's actually in my first book, too, called Israel, They Still God's People. I, I took it as being when they said his blood be upon us and upon our children as a positive thing that even though they meant it as evil, that it was actually uh, more of a redemptive covering for them. But recently, though, uh, this is a little side note, I guess you would say. I've had a little bit of a different thought on that, uh, mainly because in the Hebrew Matthew, it doesn't say exactly that. Uh, it's similar. It says seed instead of children. And, uh, and I'll show you why I, I have a very interesting uh, new thought on this here. This is in Matthew 27. Pilate, when he saw that he had no power to resist and was unable to make any peace with them before a great dispute among the people might arise because of this, he took water, washed his hands before the people and said, I am innocent of the blood. Be careful what you do. All right. And no, no joke, right? It says exactly that. You know, Shamru uh, lechem ma ta'aso. That literally means, be careful what you do, right? And all the people answered and said, His blood will be upon us and upon our seed. Now, Matthew wrote in the Hebrew language. I've proven that to you too many times. He did not write in English. He wrote in Hebrew. And it does say right there, Zaranu. Our seed. They don't say our children. Now, some would argue, well, that means the children. But I have a feeling that this is not, okay, this is, this is where we're fixing to get deep here. Just a moment. I'm going to go deep with you now. Ready? Are you ready to go into this deeper? His blood will be upon us and upon our seed. Do you remember what we have in Genesis? Let's let's take a look over here. Let me let's just jump over. Here. We'll just jump back for a moment. We're gonna to go to Genesis. We're gonna to go to chapter three, I believe it is. After this whole fall takes place, um, let's see here. Yeah, right here. I don't even like using the English because it's not translated correctly at all. Okay. All right. And I will put enmity between you, Benecha, Uvain, and between Aisha, and between the woman. Uvain, Zaracha, and between 
your seed. All right, hold, hold that thought right there. He's going to put an enmity, a hatred between, okay, between you, your between you, okay, Benecha, Uvain, now I'll put him between, between you and the woman, and between Uh, between the between the woman and 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 between your seed, okay. They got it. Oh, it was it's because English is different, so they they flip it in here between between thy seed and her seed. Okay. What well, there? Yeah, there it is, right there. The, yeah, it's flipped backwards because there's her seed. All right, that's your seed. Talking about the serpent. And between her seed, there's going to be a hatred. And he says, uh, And he will bruise your head. And you will bruise their heel. So, the thing is, what's fascinating in this right here is that, again, even from the very early part of the prophecy about the serpent and the woman, there's hatred between their seed, their descendants. Now, you could say children, but it's literally their offspring. There's going to be a hatred between them. That's why even in the next part of the verse, it's a prophecy, you know, and to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply. And actually, that's harabe. And it's literally, it's the one that's lying in wait. The great one lying in wait will cause you pain and sorrow. And that's pain and sorrow of the heart. That's the actual, the hatred. That's going to be because one boy, Cain, is going to kill his brother Abel. All right. Now, I bring this up because when we come back, let me find it again. We get back over here. Uh, goodness. All the people answered and said, his blood will be upon us and upon our seed. That's a mass killing is what it really comes down to. That's magnification of what happened between Cain and Abel. But now, that blood, you see, because if you remember when Cain killed Abel, God comes down and he says, you know, your blood, your brother's blood cries to me from, from the earth. Because he says to him, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Now, now the thing is, is they're wanting Jesus dead. And they said, his blood be upon us and our seed. So that doesn't mean it's to the Jewish people. That's why Jesus says, I'll forgive you for this. But when the Holy Spirit's come, one word against that, it will not be forgiven in this world or the world to come. He knew that they were blind, but at the same time, though, but that seed line is a little different. That's where the problem comes in. So let's take, I want to show you, though, look at it over here now. Let's, we, we jump over to, we go to Matthew 23. We're going to back up a little bit. Verse 13, Woe to you, Pharisees and sages, hypocrites, because you close up the kingdom of heaven before men. I want to bring that out before I go down to verse 33. He said, woe to them, Pharisees and sages, hypocrites, because you close up the kingdom of heaven before men. You yourselves do not enter, and those who wish to enter, you do not permit to enter. They couldn't even get in. 
Woe to you Pharisees, Pharisees and sages hypocrites, because you devour and divide the wealth of certain widows with lengthy expositions. For this you will suffer a long punishment. You encompass sea and land to bind the heart of one man to your faith, and when he is bound, he is doubly worse than before. In the King James, it says he's twofold more the child of hell than you are. So if we, as we move down, though, when you get into verse 33, this is where he goes into, he says, actually, we'll start with verse 31. In this you bear witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets. You behave according to the deeds of your fathers. Serpents, seed of vipers. There it is right there, seed of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of Gehenna if you do not turn in repentance? So when they said, his blood be upon us and upon our seed. It's not talking about the Jewish people in that regard there. This is the age old battle from Genesis where Cain kills his brother Abel. That's that age old battle that goes all the way down into to the modern state of Israel today and, and then 2000 years ago. And think about it, right? Wow. I, I want to say something, and I don't know if you'll, if you'll see it or not, but I'm hoping you will. This is why Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He had to correct the mistake from the beginning. Think about it. That had to be corrected. That's why God says that there was going to be that hatred. That's why it's a prophecy, a hatred. That's going to happen between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And the serpent's seed is right there in Matthew chapter 23. Right? Well, wrong one, sorry. Matthew 23, seed of vipers. There they are. Jesus tells you who they are. But finally, the serpent's head is wounded by Jesus. How's it wounded? Because he exposed who he really was. So the woman's seed, that fulfillment of scripture there, where he is going to bruise his head and you will bruise their heel. The reason why it says their heel is because he goes not just after Christ, but he goes after the apostles as well. So it's fascinating when you look at all of these things together. Moses gets hidden in the rock, which was Christ, until the passing of his of God's glory. And then, of course, when he passes, when his glory passes, which actually his glory was Christ coming upon the earth. And then what do we see? Moses shows up with Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. The rock is smitten. And when the rock is smitten, Christ is able to bring forth the water, which in type we see there on Calvary, on Golgotha, on, on the mountain there. And the water separated from his blood. And I know I'm kind of jumping around a lot of different areas there, but it's just fascinating to me as I look at these things. And then, of course, you know, the one thing I wasn't going to really bring out, but I'll just kind of mention it to you, though. Where was it here? Um, oh, goodness. Maybe I don't. Let's see. Yeah, this is where, you know, they were crying. They wanted they wanted the leeks, uh, you know, the garlic, the fish and everything. You know, what's interesting when they wanted fish, Jesus multiplied the fish for them. And I wasn't going to bring it out, but I'll just share it with you anyway. Now that I, now that we kind of going in different directions right here. 
but if you look in Luke's gospel, Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give of the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Uh, let's back it up a little bit. I send you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Well, I got a cat going crazy back here behind me. It shall be open unto you. For everyone that asketh receives, and he that seeketh finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will for a fish he give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? you got to remember, when we first started off in this, God was angry with them and back over in the, uh, what, what was it, Exodus there? Because they were... Offering sacrifices to gods that their fathers didn't even fear. So think about it. And so Jesus says, if they ask a fish, would you give them a serpent? Think about it. And then he takes and he goes out and, he, and, he, and when he goes to feed the multitudes, he gave them fish. Multiplied bread. And he says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're every one dead. Whoa, 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 whoa. But the manna he gave, the bread he gave, he said, he was that manna. Come from God. And I don't think he's talking about back then. I think he's talking about right then and there. Anyway. A lot could be said there. Just wanted to share some of these insights with you. And also, just as a reminder there, uh, join us this coming Thursday night. Uh, we got space for 500 people. Uh, if you'd like to come and be a part of this, we certainly welcome you to uh, come and join us there. Uh, just type in that Zoom link there. And this, this coming Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, I will be speaking on faith and how to get your faith ready. And then I will be praying for the group that is there. And at some point, uh, I will also be uh, we'll be looking to see if we can help those maybe more uh, um, independently that need to be prayed for. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. God bless you and thank you for listening. And by the way, too, if you want to help support the work we do, uh, that's something that has really fell way off uh, in, in a lot of areas there. But please do. Uh, just visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, and um, you can donate there via uh, either by mail, uh, Stephen Benoon at P.O. Box 156 Sunbright, Tennessee. That's right above my head. The website's above my head as we're speaking here. And uh, but you could donate, uh, uh, you know, by mail or online. Uh, online is the quickest, easiest way. And your help, uh, support of this ministry is greatly appreciated. And, uh, and of course, there's other ways that you can also support the work we do and, and actually help yourself at the same time. And that's strictly up to you. But if you wanted to go to uh, LifeWave and, you know, order for your own family the actual, um, the, the, the products that, the, that this company has to offer, like the X39 that stimulates your own body stem cells, you know, we don't get a whole lot, but it does help us. And if you became on auto ship, you know, you would actually help yourself tremendously as well as help support the ministry as well. We would actually rather see that. We would rather see you benefit yourself uh, as well and get a smaller portion of what maybe you would normally donate to the ministry and try to help yourself. So we thank you for that. Either way, it's really up to you. Uh, and they do have this uh, performance bundle. And when you're on an auto ship here, it's normally $279.95, but it's only $179.95. You save 100 bucks if you put that on an auto ship there. And believe me, for the both of those together, amazing. And, uh, and theoretically, uh, they've done some studies on it already. It even creates somewhat of a um, 
Faraday cage effect in the body because it, 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 it is working on copper peptides, two different copper peptides in the body. And they have seen in early studies that some people have been helped as a result of even the EMF and 5G technologies uh, as a way to uh, protect against that. I'm not saying that it will, but it just early studies have shown some promising effects with that. Uh, or if you just want to do the stimulate your stem cells only with X39, you could do that. And, uh, and if you're on auto ship, you save 50 bucks a month. It's kind of like the EMP shield. Uh, an EMP shield still is not a bad idea, uh, especially with the threat of global war all around us there. Uh, if you do decide to do, get yourself an EMP shield, whether it's for your home, your automobile, whatever the case may be, I always recommend the automobile, but really and truly your house really needs one as well. But anytime you add any of that to your cart, you just got to remember to put INL50 as your code. Uh, that gets you the $50 discount, and um, and once you do that that discount there, they take that off, and you can see right there, $389 to $339, you save money by doing so. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.